God on today. Let's just open in prayer. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for each precious person who's come here this morning, God. They got out of their beds. They got dressed on a Sunday morning when they could have lounged around and went to brunch. But God, I just pray that you would bless them on today. God, with the word, your corruptible, incorruptible seed of your word, God, that it would yield um, a hundredfold in their lives. God, I pray that you will open our eyes and our ears, our understanding. And we pray most of all that you be magnified. Yes. You be magnified in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Am I getting on I got one slide going. All oh, y'all got to look over here. All right. Oh, there it is. Ah, speak it. Speak that word. Won't he do it? All right, how many people like going to Target? <laughs> Do I have any, is it me? Do I have any other Target people? Have you ever just gone to Target to pick up one thing? <laughs> any of those people? I'm just going to pick up one or two items, right? And then you find yourself walking around Target, and you know the way they put the little owls, it's just very appealing. Makes you start thinking about life like, oh, I really need this. So, you know, you're walking around with a few items. You know, like, I just meant to, I'm just going to pick up a few. So your arms are full. Then it gets ridiculous. You know, like, you know, I'm just going to go get a little hand cart. Because that's all I need. I just need a few items, right? So you get a little hand cart, and then you, you discover you need a gallon of milk all of a sudden, right? So you're like lugging things, and you're walking around Target. You look ridiculous, you know. And all because what? We're too lazy to go way to the front of the store to get a cart because we are only picking up a few items, right? We're in denial. I'm not getting a lot of stuff. But, you know, you're walking around, you know, heavy laden. So a lot of us can relate to that. But I like to propose that sometimes this is how our Christian life is like. We're walking around with lots of burdens unnecessarily. There's a cart available to you. And that cart I want to present to you is worship. That cart is worship. Um, we, we're going to talk about how worship can lighten your load. We've been on this series, Lighten Your Load Summer. And um, how many people have some loads they need to, to un unburden themselves of? Oh, yeah, I see you, sister. Put on everything in. Put your whole self in. <laughs> yes. Now let's talk about worship. When, typically when we think about worship, we usually think about the song portion of the church service, right? That's worship. You know, when we're lifting our hands, our eyes are closed, it's really heartfelt. I remember when we were growing up, praise was the fast songs and worship was the slow songs, right? <laughs> that was praise and worship. But uh, here's a, a simple definition. A simple definition of worship is simply the heartfelt acknowledgement of God in all his power and glory. It's heartfelt. And yes, it can be an outer expression, but we can't limit worship just to outer expressions, right? Because how many people have been there with me? You got your hands lifted, your eyes are closed, and you're thinking, did I take the chicken out? Oh, Jesus. If I didn't, okay, if I didn't take you out, where am I going to go to eat afterwards? Cause, yes, Lord. Because if I go out, you know what? I really like that place around the corner. That's where I'm going. Yes, give the Lord a hand, right? You know. So we can't always limit worship just to an outer expression. Because that could be, you know, here nor there, depending on our mental, you know, state at that time. But it's more of a posture of your heart. Worship is a posture of your heart. So I want to convince you today that worship is an attitude and a lifestyle. All right? It's an attitude and a lifestyle. So what? I'm going to need everybody, if you can get your Bibles out. I don't know if we have Bibles available. We totally have Bibles. If you need one, or you can get your Bible app out. If you need a Bible, our wonderful greeters could help you out. We're going to turn to Chronicles, Second Chronicles. It's in the Old Testament. So on your Bible app, get that out. Not Corinthians. It could be tricky. We're on Chronicles. Second Chronicles. 
If you're in a little church Bible, it's on page uh, 350. Just kind of help you out. Shortcuts. That's what I'm here for. All right. Uh, we're going to 2 Chronicles 20. 2 Chronicles 20. And we're going to see how God used worship in this particular instance to lighten a load. Yeah. All right? To lighten a load. Everybody there? You're going to need to follow along because we're moving fast, people. Here we go. All right, you ready? <laughs> All right. Um, so just a little background information on, in Chapter 20. Um, we're dealing with a king named King Jehoshaphat, right? He was the king of Judah. Back then, there was a king of Israel. He's the king of Judah. Um, if you look just over in your Bible or turn back, in chapter 19, you'll see um, he made some reforms. Jehoshaphat got his act together. You know, he was, you know, a little on the shady side, and then he reformed. He got it cleaned up. He got everything right in the kingdom. He got people worshiping right. He, he set up judges and priests. He, he did a good job. He cleaned up his act. He was doing a good job. So let's go to verse, uh, chapter 20 and verse 1. Everybody there? It says, after this, and I'm reading in the uh, NRSV version if you need that in your app. It says, um, after this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and after this, the Moabite and the Ammonites, and with them, some of the Menunites, all these ites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. So hold up. I just told you in verse 19, he got his act together. He was doing right. He was, he was on the up and up. And then you're telling me in the next verse, it says these people came up against him. The very next verse, they came up against him. Isn't that kind of how it is every time you start doing right? Every time you make up your mind, I'm doing, I'm doing it for Jesus, right? <laughs> Live my life. Every time you decide to do right, something comes against you. Yeah. Am I alone? Anybody ever felt that? Yeah. Finally got your act together. I'm going to start going to church. But then here come these ites. <laughs> I could, we could feel them in bill lights, co-worker ites. We're not going to go there. All right. We always come in, they, things are going, and you know, I just want you to know, I want, we're going to keep it 100, things are going to always come up against you in life, right? We're always, there's always going to be something, as long as you're living. Um, but just like in Target, will you carry all these things with you? Or will you, will you find a place to unload it, right? Um, so let's see, let's see, where in verse, all these things came up against him. Let's look at uh, verse 3. Everybody there? Jeho Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he set himself to seek the Lord. So think about when you are going through things. What is your first reaction when things come up against you? What's typically your first, what do you usually do? Yeah, you get the video like, well, no, I know you, I know they not, right? We get all on the defensive. Oh, no, you didn't. But look at, look, look, look. this is, if we're going to lighten our load through worship, the first thing you have to know is that worship is a choice. It's a choice. So, and I also want to acknowledge that Brother Jehoshaphat, he was afraid. Can we just stay right there? Can we acknowledge that he's afraid? Because a lot of times we do these, these Bible things and they seem like they're superheroes and they went in and they saved the day and we're like oh that's good for them but I'm scared to death right anybody have ever been afraid things are coming against you I'm not talking about like little things like these are life-threatening things that come against us he was afraid and I, I like that the Bible took great care to say that to let us know that he was afraid because sometimes we do get afraid we do get afraid, and uh, God wants to acknowledge that, our fear. But what are you going to do with it? The first thing he did is that it was a choice. So the next time something comes up, instead of settling it your usual way, it is your choice to say, you know what, this time I'm going to seek the Lord. Yeah. I'm going to seek the Lord about this. Now look, it said he set his face. He set his face. To seek the Lord. He set himself.
to seek the Lord. That means it was intentional. It wasn't like, oh, I guess I'll talk to God about it. It was intentional. You ever tried to set yourself to do something? You had to set your alarm clock, set your snooze, right? You set yourself. Try to set yourself. Try to set yourself to look down. You got to put your... You got to put some effort into that thing. He set himself to seek the Lord. It was intentional. Somebody says it's intentional. If you're going to lighten your load, worship has to be a choice. All right, our next point, we're going to move to verse 5. Let's see what's happening in this. So the people are coming. He's scared. He's like, you know what? First thing I'm going to do, I'm not going to be mad. I'm not going to cry. I'm, not going, to, I'm going to seek the Lord. Let's look at verse 5. Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our ancestors, are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nation? Is your, in your hand our power and might so that no one is able to withstand you. No one is a, the first thing you need to do, the second thing you're going to need to do is to remind yourself of who God is. Yeah. When you, next time you face a situation that's, that's facing you and the, the load is too hard for you, you need to remind yourself of who God is. Look at all these. He was like, are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule? Is, aren't you the great God? So you need to look back over your life. Isn't he the one that did it the last time? Isn't he the one that paid that bill for you? Didn't you get that job? Aren't you, didn't he get, make a way for you last time? If he did it before, he can do it again. You have to remind yourself, because sometimes new things come up in our life. We act brand new. We just, act, we just asked God to pay that, that same rent last week. He did it. Rent come out. Oh, Lord, we, what are we going to do? Oh, Jesus, we're going to die, right? He's the same God. He did it before. He'll do it again. Don't tell yourself how big your problem is. Tell your problem how big your God is. You got to remind yourself sometimes. Wait a minute. You got to break your... Wait, this is the same God. So... Remind yourself. That's what he did. That's what Brother Jehoshaphat did. He stopped. He said, wait a minute. You're the same God that brought us out of these situations before. Right? Let's move down to verse 10. This is drama going on in this story. What's going to happen? <laughs> verse 10. He said, um, see now the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Israel of Egypt and whom they avoided and did not destroy. They reward us by coming to drive us out of your, of the possession of the, your possession that you have given to us to inherit. This is one of my favorite verses. Oh Lord God, will you not execute judgment upon them? For we are powerless against this great multitude that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. But our eyes are on you. If we're going to lighten our load through worship, we have to give up self-reliance. We got to give up our way of doing things. Check out this situation. These people who are coming against them is a backstory back in Numbers, in the book of Numbers, when the children of Israel were coming through that part of the region, God was like, oh, you know what, leading them along, don't mess with them, just pass on through, then, you know, let them be. So then years later, they got the nerve to come back like, oh, we about to come and fight y'all. We about to come destroy y'all. So they felt backstabbed. They felt betrayed. Of like, really? We gave y'all mercy, and now you're going to come up against us? Does this sound familiar in anyone's? Life, oh really I helped you? Oh really I fed you? Oh really I gave you money? And now you, you coming against me? Oh I'm the bad one now? Am I alone in this? Maybe it's just personal issues that are coming up. This is my therapy session. All right, I got some people with me. Have you ever felt betrayed? These people are coming up against the people that they previously had mercy upon them. But then, I love this. He said, we don't, we don't know what to do. He said, we are powerless. He said, oh, Lord, would you, will you not execute judgment upon them? 
I want to stop right there. Because we forget God does execute judgment. Does anyone believe that still? God executes judgment. We can't, we can't believe that he would. God still execute judgment. And even though we got a lot of things going on in our world and it's looking like, um, God, do you see the same news that I'm seeing? Are you watching social media like we watching it, Lord? But I want to encourage you to be encouraged that God, yes, he does execute judgment. It might not always come in the form that we can see currently in this present situation, but God will execute judgment. Anyone believe that with me? So every time you see something on the news or something going crazy, oh, no, God, you're going to execute judgment. And sometimes he'll use us to do that. He'll use us to fight for justice in that situation, right? But check out verse 12. He said, we are powerless against this great multitude. Powerlessness. This is a, this is a feeling that most of us have experienced if you lived in the hood. Powerlessness. Just, a, just being in a state where I don't know what to do. All these things are happening. I have no control. Nobody asked my opinion. Nobody asked my vote. Even if I gave my vote, they overrode it. They only, I don't even have a voice. Have you ever been in a situation when you don't have a voice? You feel powerless. I love the Bible because it's acknowledging these feelings. We can feel afraid. We feel powerless sometimes. Sit with that feeling sometimes. God... I'm, I don't know what to do, but I love this about God because sometimes he'll bring you to this point where you run out of options. You don't have not one more person to call. You can't call Uncle Leroy and them no more. They said no more money is all dried up. Bank account, no. Parents, no. Okay, can't talk. I like you. You can't even call Tyrone. Lord have mercy. You know you are the options. You can't even call Tyrone. Oh. Ooh, Lord have mercy. Out of options, but do you know God will put you in that situation where you will run out of options and all you have is him? All you have is him? Oh, if you haven't been there, you, boy, got to pull that bottom out. Yeah. And there is nobody else you can call. Nobody. nobody else can help you. And then we like, God, why? He's like, no, this is why. I need you to see me in this light. I'm all you need. I'm all you need. So if you, if you kind of in that powerless situation, you in a good place. Now you're in a place where you're going to see God show out on your behalf. How many, how many are ready for that? How many want God to show out for them? All right, let's keep moving. On um, verse 14. Okay, so he's like, for real, you're going to let these people do this to me? Um, and they don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. He didn't know what to do. I'm still on 12. God, we don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. What a beautiful statement. I don't know what to do, God, but I'm going to look to you. I'm not going to look to my friend's advice. I'm going to not look for my family's advice. I'm not going to read a book about it. I'm not going to uh, Google it. But my eyes are on you. Will you be a people in here who will fix your eyes on God? Will you fix your eyes on God in these situations? God, I don't know what to do, but I'm going I'm, I'm what you need me to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you, God. Wait, go left? All right, what? Our eyes are on you. Verse 14. Um, or let's, we can start um, at 14. It says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel. And he had a lot of dads. And we, I'll just skip over to all of them. And he said, Listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, Do not fear. Or be dismayed at this great multitude. For the battle is not yours but God's. Yeah. Woo, Jesus. Yeah. Tomorrow you will go against them. You will go down against them. And they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley before the wilderness of Jebruel. This battle is not for you to fight. Take position. Stand still. 
and see the victory of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. Oh, my gosh. We, the Bible just preaches his own self. Preaches his own self. The next thing you need to know if you want to lift your burden through worship, please know and believe that God fights battles. Do you believe that today? God fights battles. This is a news flash for some of us because we, we, we got this image of God that he's so meek and mild. You know, he got the wavy hair. He can't mess up his hair. He's like kind and quiet and timid. But this isn't, the, this isn't the God that's being portrayed. We have a God who fights battles. See, all, all your life, you've been, you've been like Miss Seeley. All my life, I had to fight. You've been fighting your whole life because you didn't believe that God fights battles. Now, some of our, you know, some of us, some of us, you know, some of us got a little hood in us, a little, little ratchet in us. And this kind of guy might appeal to some of us. Because God fights battles? What? God fights? I mean, okay, I don't want to, you know, bust you out, but I mean, back in the day, you had hands, you know, just, boy, oh, you want to see you? Or run up, run up, it. what? Was you known for hands? You know, like, you didn't, people tried it, and then they were like, oh, no, 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 don't, don't, don't fight her. Don't fight him. No, 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 no. Some of y'all, y'all know y'all in church. I ain't going to bust y'all out like that. But some of y'all, you know, had these hands. I work with kids, I'm sorry. Some of you like enjoyed fighting growing up. But this God might appeal to you if that's you and you got that interaction in that, that God fights, that he fights battles, that he goes to war, that God knocks, you know, he, he can knock some things and he could throw his weight around. So we got, sometimes we got a too puny image of God. Do you know that we serve a God that is strong and mighty? And he can do what he want at the wave of a hand and at, at, at just his word. He just spoke the words into his, the world into existence. He just spoke it. Do you understand what kind of God we serve? He can fight. He can fight battles. And this is what he told him. Isn't it amazing that one word changed everything? Brother Jay Hazriel, Jay Hazriel, what you know his name. Brother Jehaziel, the Spirit of the Lord came on him, and he gave a word. One word changed everything. Yeah. Do you know one word that God speaks into your life can change everything? Yeah. Just one word. Think about it. They were going into battle. These people coming up. And, Tell me right now at the point of this story what changed. The people were still coming. They were still coming to attack them. They were still like, what are we going to do? And then God sent a word. And it changed everything. God wants to speak a word into your life today. One word will change everything. The situation didn't change. It was still present tense. They still, but they were like, what? God's, God's going to fight it for us? Oh, that changes everything. It changed everything. It, nothing changed but their perspective. So God has you here just to change your perspective on things. You might go home, ain't nothing changed. Everybody's still acting up. Everybody, but guess what has changed? Your perspective of how to, how to fight this battle. How are we gonna fight it? Look at verse 20. Um, yeah, verse 20, then they all bowed down to the ground. Uh, we are uh, in verse 20. It says, this is very key. They rose early in the morning. God gave a word, and they rose early in the morning. I went too fast. Hold on. Hold up, hold up. Yes, 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 yes. All right, y'all with me? Good. They rose early in the morning. It says that after they got the word, they still got up, and they went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. So the key in this is that they still had to show up 
for the battle. God gave him a word. He promised him victory. But what was their part in this story? They just had to show up. Now they could have just been like, you know, we just going to sleep in our little tent. God's fighting a battle. So what we really need to be there for, you know, we just go ahead, God. You got it. I. Right. Oh, that God all right. Ain't no. They got up early in the morning and still went out. So even though God has given you a word, he's changing your perspective, you still need to show up. You still need to show up. You still need to be present. You still need to go to work every day, even though they're on your nerves. You still need to be there in your home. You don't use it as an escape. Oh, God's going to handle it. I'm not going to deal with it. No, God still needs you to show up. These, these people showed up. God will fight your battle, but he will show up. And look at verse, boy, I tell you, verse 20, they showed up. And then in verse 21, after they had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy splendor as they went where? They went where? Ahead of the army, before the army saying, give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. <laughs> this is the craziest battle plan ever. <laughs> so you telling me, an army's coming up against you. It was like three of them. It was, they was about to, they was coming like, we coming for y'all, right? They going, okay, let's, let's consult the people. God's going to give us the victory. Let's put the praise team out in front. That'd be great. You guys ready? Yeah. You're up. Just imagine when we go over to Iraq and all these things that we're fighting. Can you imagine them having people with robes going out before the <laughs> praise the Lord? Right? Do you see how ridiculous this is in human, per like through our perspective? They would send a choir before an army. So this tells me what is your, what is your battle position? Worship is your battle position. You're going to fight. You're in a situation you don't know what to do. You got a heavy load. You tired. Aren't you tired of arguing with people? Aren't you tired of just going all around in circles with the same situation? They're not listening to you. They ain't hearing you. You're just frustrated. Well, you need to take up a new battle position because you've been fighting people with your, with, with your physical per person. But God wants to show you a, a better way to handle this situation. It's the craziest battle plan ever. Look what happened in uh, verse 22. And as they begin to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the Ammonites. Oh, my God. Moab and Mount Seir, who had come up against Judah, so that they were routed. For the Ammonites and Moab attacked the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them utterly. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped destroy one another. So God set an ambush. <laughs> The people who came to fight, they was like, we all getting together. You know, like you're going to jump somebody. We all getting together. Jump them. They start fighting and destroy each other. And they just, it was just a one big mass melee. They all destroyed one another. The enemies destroyed themselves. God set an ambush against them. They couldn't even touch the people of God. It was the craziest battle plan. You got enemies in your life? You got haters, whatever, those. God is saying he will, who, who set the ambush? Did they go and put traps out at night? All they did was worship. All they did was worship God in the beauty of his holiness. All they did was worship him, and God fought that battle. Think about something that you need God to fight for right now. Think about that situation. Think about that problem. All God is asking you, just worship me. Watch me fight that battle for you. 
You've been using too much energy fighting this battle on your own. How many tired? Are you, you know, I'm just tired. I'm just sick and tired of y'all. Well, guess what? This is the answer for that. You don't need to be let. How about you let God fight this battle? Let worship lighten your load. Now I have a question. Why is worship so powerful? Why? You know, sometimes it's like, okay, God is like, worship me. And we're like, well, what, what does that mean, God? Like, do you just, like, enjoy people talking about you? Is this some kind of narcissistic thing you got going on, God, where you just want to hear people talk about you? You know, you know, these are thoughts I have. I don't know if you, I'll put myself out there. What is this worship thing about? Why is this so powerful? Why does God need worship? Well, it says that God inhabits the praise of his people. That means he lives in, in the praises of his people. He's enthroned in the, in the praises of his people. So when you are enthroned, it's like you're installing someone as king. So every time you worship, you are installing God as king of your life. And everything else has to bow down. Everything else has to bow, God, bow, bow down to God. So it's the posture of your heart. God is worthy of worship. There's nobody else like him. Tell me somebody else like God. Tell me anybody who could do everything that he does. That's why the powerful, the song, did you hear the song that they sung? That, that was their battle song. I had to take a, you know, I was like, that was their battle song. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his love endures forever. You know, I would have had like a more of a better playlist. Like, <laughs> we are the champions. You know, another one bites the dust. Like, ah, yeah. The John Cena theme song can't see me. I mean, I would have had a better playlist. But that was their song. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his love endures forever. There's nobody else like our God. So when you're worshiping him, you're acknowledging that. It's not that he needs to hear himself, how good he is. There's literally nobody else like him. There's nobody else worthy of praise. There's nobody else worthy of our adoration, of our, of our love. There's nobody else worthy. So it's a posture of your heart. Now, worship is not a thing to manipulate God to move on your behalf. I don't want you to walk away from here and be like, ooh, all I got to do is like, thank you, Jesus, and then the whole situation is going to move. We don't use worship as a pawn like, God, I'll worship you if you will. Move this over here. Don't you want worship? You know? It's not something to manipulate him. But the thing about worship is so sweet when it's freely given. When it's freely given, that's why God lives in the praises, when it's freely given. Why? Because he's given us free will. We've talked about this before. He's given us a choice to worship him. He could have just had the millions of angels that he created just worship him, and they're already doing that in his presence. He has angels right now who says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, 24-7. There's people in heaven that worship him right now all day, every day. But they're angels, and that's their job. So when he created us in his image, he created us with a choice. And the beautiful thing about a choice is that we choose to worship God. Out of all the choices out here, all the things we could worship, cars, money, people, jobs, for us to choose to worship him yeah. is the sweetest thing to him. Like, you, you, you want to worship me? You see me? You acknowledge me? That I'm God and King? I'm going to live right there. I'm going to live in that situation. That's why you can physically, tangibly feel the presence of God. Anyone ever felt the, the beautiful presence of God? It's unlike anything you've ever felt in your life because he lives in that praise. Because you chose to give your free will to him. And it's the most beautiful thing that you could give to God is your free choice. But before we worship God, we got to settle our trust issues with him. We got to settle our trust issues that we have with God. Because when we're worshiping, we're saying you are God, you are king, you are Lord. There's nobody else like you. Some of us have, you know... We believe that, but do we really believe that? Do you trust and believe that?
that God is who he says he is. Because he's, he's either the truth or he's a liar. He's either a good father or he's a bad father. He's either trustworthy or he's, reali- or he's reliable, unreliable. But he can't be both. Y'all hear me? He can't be both. So you're going to have to make a decision within your heart who God is to you. Is he the God that he says he is? That you read about in the scripture? And if he's not, then he's not. Then why are we here? Why are we playing? Why are we wavering between two opinions? See, the problem with worship is not effective if you don't know God for yourself. That's when, that's when worship's not effective. That means you're just here thinking about chicken like I was. You're just here doing the thing, right? Worship is declaring who God is and speaking well of him. But flow with me. How do you speak well of someone you don't know personally? So if I were to ask you, oh, what do you think? I might be hiring somebody. What do you think about this gentleman? I could only go on your secondhand information. I could only go by what somebody else has told me. I don't know this person personally. We kind of do God like that. Oh, yeah, I heard he did this, he did that. Oh, yeah. We recite Bible stories and all kind of things. Yeah, I know God, but it's only secondhand information. How can you trust somebody you don't know? Would you you just marry a complete stranger? Like, I mean, you know, at least you want some background information. But we're saying we're committing to this Christian walk. And it's as serious as a marriage, and then we don't even know who we're getting into this deal with. The only way to get to know God is to go through situations. It's the only way. It's the only way. It's the only way. So you've been, you know, rebelling and kicking against the things that are, that's going on in your life. But God is saying, that's my opportunity for you to see me in my glory. How do you know God's a healer unless you're ever sick? How do you know God is a deliverer if you never are in bondage? How do you know God can make a way out of no way if if you've never been in a place where you ran out of options? The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste. Now, really think about that. You could make me a cake, and you'd be like, you could describe it all. And I'd be like, ooh, that sounds so good. But until I taste it, I can't really fully experience the whole thing that you're trying to explain to me. You have to physically taste it. A lot of us, we have to taste and see God. We've just been seeing, but you haven't really dipped all the way in to really fully and capture what he wants for you. You got to jump off that edge and just really taste and see that he is good. So we're closing. But those hard situations in your life right now, they are designed for you to get to know the God that you say you believe in. Can I say that again? Those situations you're going on, think about in your life, it's designed for you to get to know the God you say you believe in. Is he really faithful? Is he really trustworthy? Will he really make a way out of no way? Will he really do it? So worship is a lifestyle, like we said. Lifestyle was saying to God, you are greater than this situation. I thank you that you are strong. I thank you that you are mighty. I thank you that you will help me. How will you, when these situations come up, Will you react or will you worship? If you don't walk away with anything else today, anything I've said, walk away with this. When a situation comes up in your life, and it will, will you react or will you worship? Because when you worship, you are acknowledging Jehoshaphat was afraid. They didn't know what to do. But he said, my eyes are on you. My eyes are on you, God. When the situation comes, yeah, I see all this, but God, I know you're faithful. 
God, I know what they're saying, but you're great and mighty. God, I hear, uh, yeah, I know, I got a bill due, but you're well able. This is how God wants to lighten that burden you've been carrying for so long. Will you worship him? Will you acknowledge that he is God? Will you acknowledge that he is well able? This is the sole reason God brought you here today. John 4, 23 and 24 says that God is seeking worshipers. He is actively seeking worshipers. It says, yet the time is coming and has come now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Those are the kind of worshipers the Father speaks. God is a spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Do I have anybody in here who will seek God, who will worship him? Do we have anyone who's willing to worship him?